Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Shane Gebauer. I'm the general manager of Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all for, uh, uh, here this evening, and thank you for coming. I apologize for a slight delay in our, our start. We had some technical difficulties, and, and along that same vein, um, I'm hoping everything will go smoothly here this evening. However, uh, here at the Bee Farm, we have had a uh, had a day of, of uh, heavy rains and, and power flickers here and there. So hopefully that won't interrupt us this evening, but we'll, uh, we'll cross our fingers and, and proceed as, as ha we have to. I would like to welcome uh, two of our, uh, our speakers that are here with me this evening. We've got Mary Gail Meister. from uh, She's the founder and president of Denver Bees. Um, obviously in Denver. She was instrumental in uh, creating some city ordinances that uh, allowed for the beekeeping within the city limits. Uh, so she'll be our, our Western perspective on this evening's uh, conversation. And of course we've got Kim Flottam who is the editor of Bee Culture Magazine. Uh, you can see the website there, beeculture.com. Um, from my perspective, I think it's one of, well, it's one of two, but it's the better of the two uh, magazines that uh, provides good, uh, applicable, hands-on information for beekeepers to aid them in their hobby and craft. So I'd like to welcome the two of them, Mary Gail and Kim, with us this evening. Um, we're going to, uh, I'm actually going to kick things off. Normally I'm sort of in the background lurking, but uh, I'm going to actually contribute here a little bit besides just as a facilitator. And, and get us started with um, our second year, getting them strong, getting them healthy, and, and hopefully producing a good, a good honey crop. Um, so let's uh, get into that. All of us, all three of us, uh, when we started uh, combining our talks and the content of this evening, really focused in on, on four key aspects that play a role in, in uh, getting a hive up and running in, in early spring uh, and getting them ready for the, the nectar flow uh, in spring and into summer. And those aspects are, of course, the spring cleaning. There's obviously some attrition that occurs in a beehive during the course of winter. It's a natural process. It's inevitable. And how do you go about cleaning that up? And I'm going to spend some time really focusing in on that uh, inspection and feeding. Uh, and then hive health and, of course, swarm management. And uh, each one of us will sort of address each one of these in, in slightly different uh, emphasis, with a slightly different emphasis as we progress through. So let's first talk about spring cleaning. Um, you may encounter, this is, this is not a, a site uh, that uh, we really like to see. This is a colony that's obviously suffered from uh, nosema. Um, you may see this in varying degrees. Uh, sometimes it may actually claim the colony. Sometimes it may just be a severely weakened colony as a result. These sorts of things, you certainly want to get rid of those dead bees. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about frame culling. Some of these frames, you, if they're old, um, you may want to cull them because, of course, that dysentery is going to really contain high levels of nosema spores that have the potential to afflict that colony in the future or, uh, if it's a dead out, may afflict the colony that you've reestablished on that equipment. So we'd want to clean that up, scrape it out. Some people suggest uh, actually washing it down. Uh, I think we'll hear later, later on, perhaps on a, on a different take on how to call frames. Um, but you want to try and clean this up as best as possible and get rid of these, uh, these frames. Uh, another uh, thing that you may encounter is if uh, your entrance reducer has fallen out uh, during the course of the winter or perhaps you were uh, a bit uh, delayed in, in getting that uh, reducer into the colony before fall set in, you may encounter a little critter such as this, uh, this mouse we see here. And, and these, these things can actually create a fair amount of, of mess. You can see a lot of dead bees in there on, on this slide over here. Uh, in this picture over here, you can also see a lot of uh, wax debris. And believe it or not, this is actually a screened bottom board. So there's a, a, a tremendous amount of debris that's accumulated in this colony. Uh, leaves that have been brought in, etc., from this mouse that's preventing good ventilation and preventing a, and inhibiting those bees from keeping a good clean colony. So you certainly want to 
you want to get rid of all this, this uh, debris that's in here as part of your spring cleaning, getting your colony ready. Um, also, uh, you may encounter some frames like this. Again, the colony could still be alive and well, but um, as that uh, colony moved about the, uh, the, uh, the hive during the course of the winter, yeah, some bees may have been sort of neglected on the fringes. Uh, their heads are in the cells. Uh, this is a clear sign uh, of starvation. They, they're down in the bottom of those cells looking for any little bit of honey that they can get. Uh, so you may have some frames that look like this. The whole colony may look like this if it's actually perished due to starvation. Um, but you want to get these, these frames cleaned out. Oftentimes, uh, there's nothing wrong with these frames. It's just a matter of getting the bees removed. You don't want to leave them in there. You can actually see um, if I if click on uh, some of these areas like right in here, this is actually some mold that's beginning um, to form. And these bees uh, will need to clean that out if, and it'll get more severe if you don't address it uh, early on. So you want to try and get these bees out. A lot of times you can just simply shake that frame aggressively and they, they'll come out of the cells. You may have to get a little bit more tedious by actually picking them out, but you can't uh, leave these in there um, for a long period of time, otherwise they will mold. Now, if, if you come across this and you, you're going to do a, a split or reestablish this colony, uh, essentially immediately the bees will take care of this, but again, it's more effort that they've got to put in. Um, if you can do it for them, uh, they'll be much better off. The other thing that I like to do is um, also just take this opportunity uh, to do a thorough cleaning. So here's the top of the hive. You can see there's some burr comb, there's some brace comb, uh, wax, uh, bridge comb between the frames. I like to scrape all of this down, um, clean off uh, the rabbits, uh, the frame rests back in here, which I haven't done yet in this picture, but as I pull these frames out, I'll scrape all this down so that it makes uh, manipulations easier later on in the season, makes it easier for those frames to be slid uh, about that frame rest. Of course, they'll inevitably wax and propolize them back into place, but if you, if you try and keep that clean, it makes it a little easier. Clean up those top bars and get these, the frames um, uh, ready to go for the coming season. Um, if you've got, uh, this is a little later on, we can see some drone, uh, drone brood in there. Clean up all this, uh, get rid of all this brace comb, get a hive nice and clean and ready, easy to ma manipulate. And of course, as you're doing this, as you're pulling these frames out and cleaning them up, what you want to be looking for is, is some older frames that perhaps are less than pristine and this is an opportunity to call those frames to get rid of them and incorporate new equipment into your operation. The uh, prevailing uh, rule of thumb, depending on who you speak with, is about three to five years. Every three to five years, you should have a complete rotation of your, your brood comb in a colony. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that on year three you throw everything out and start fresh, but rather you may call a third to a fifth of your frames each year um, so that eventually at the end of that three-year period or five-year period, whatever uh, regiment you're uh, subscribing to, um, that you have a complete rotation of comb. And here in this picture, you can see we've got a, a, a lot of drone here on the edge and some drone comb uh, being built here. And you've also got this huge void of comb here. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, looks like wax and propolis down in here. This to me almost looks like uh, maybe a frame that fell victim to uh, the mouse that we saw earlier uh, just a few slides ago that perhaps built a, mess, uh, a nest in here. And they actually tried to sort of seal it up maybe with some propolis and keep things uh, as sterile as they, they possibly can. So if you come across frames uh, such as this. This is an opportunity in early spring to get rid of these and incorporate new equipment into your colony. Um, uh, I typically use all mediums for both my honey supers and for my brood chambers. So I like to take frames for my honey supers that are already drawn out and move them down into my brood chambers. Of course, I don't go the other way around. I don't like to move brood up into my honey supers. But moving uh, honey frames down into the uh, brood chamber gets them, keeps them moving. Uh, they don't have a lot of uh, resources that they need to invest to draw that comb. They're able to keep right on trucking and, and 
that queen can keep laying, they can keep storing pollen and hopefully bringing in some nectar. Um, and, and then of course we need to clean off the, uh, the bottom board. These bees, uh, if they're left there, again, can trap moisture, begin to mold, create some problems. Um, so you want to get these uh, scraped off um, and, and cleaned out so that uh, they're out of there and any chance of those, the mildew and such um, is removed. Um, also, uh, I like to think about nutrition. Um, it's, it sort of surprises me to some extent that, uh, that a lot of beekeepers overlook nutrition. Um, it seems to be something that uh, um, we take for granted. Uh, yet there's been a lot of research as of late that our colonies really are uh, suffering from, from poor nutrition, uh, that feeding a pollen patty um, can help with, uh, with nosema and other diseases. Colonies with a high mite count that are fed a, a, a patty are deemed just as healthy as colonies with a low mite count but are not fed. Um, that research uh, was presented at an ABF meeting now probably two or three years ago uh, and yet we're still choosing to overlook nutrition. So nutrition is an important factor, especially in spring when resources are, are limited. Your colony is trying to grow. Uh, in, in our case here in North Carolina, those queens began to lay uh, a good month ago, if not uh, uh, two months ago. So they are desperate for pollen. They are desperate for honey or, or sugar syrup or corn syrup, whatever it is you're choosing to feed. Um, and so good nutrition early on can really grow a colony and strengthen it and get them up and running before that, uh, that nectar flow uh, starts. And I, I have to say the last bullet point there is stolen from our uh, uh, Kim Flottam, who is here, our esteemed Kim Flottam, who says uh, that a $2.50 pollen patty is the best insurance against having to replace a, an, an $80 package of bees. Um, so that's not my... And uh, forgive me, Kim, for perhaps throwing you under the bus. I'm not sure, but I'm I'm pretty sure you've said that in the past. Um, so a pollen patty. Uh, here's a pollen patty on the top of uh, a hive. You can see the bees starting to take it. This is very early in spring, um, trying to get this colony uh, some protein so that they can uh, build some brood and strengthen their numbers. Um, and then also in in spring. Typically, our, our bees are at the top of the hive, so we take off the outer cover and this is what an inner cover, and this is what we see all the bees up top, and uh, the box below. If we're running two stories or three stories, the boxes below are typically empty, such as we see here. Um, before these bees really begin to uh, lay a lot of brood, so in other words, if, if uh, brood span between the bottom portion of the top box and the top portion of the bottom box, I probably wouldn't reverse them because I'd split the brood nest. But if I catch them early enough, I like to move that top box down to the bottom and the bottom box to the top. Um, that gives them a sense of space. Uh, it allows them to move up with their brood nest and store the, uh, the, the nectar and, and produce honey up above. And then that uh, upward movement eventually will, will continue on into the, uh, into the honey supers, which will be placed on the colony later. So this is something that I also do early on in spring before they're heavily brooded. Uh, and, and I don't want to, again, I don't want to run the risk of splitting that brood nest. I want to make sure that all the brood is in that top box um, and, and I don't want to wait uh, for them to start moving down into that bottom box before I do that. And then, of course, you, you need to keep an eye on, on the strength of this colony. You need to keep uh, an eye on, on their space requirements and keep, be mindful of that. So here's a frame of just plugged up brood um, with some honey up there in the corners. Um, this colony, if I have a lot of frames like this, is just going to be busting at the seams, and so swarming is going to be an issue potentially if, if I don't keep ahead of them and provide the space that they need. So you want to stay ahead and ensure that you're adding supers, maybe giving empty comb for them to expand into if, if swarming is, is looking uh, inevitable. And of course, along those same lines, 
whoops, sorry, wrong direction. Um, you want to make sure that uh, you've got your queen present and that she's in there and she's got a good brood pattern. Uh, if not, you might want to consider replacing that queen depending on her age and depending on what that brood pattern looks like. And, and how you go about replacing that queen, there's a lot of different methods. Um, you can simply buy a queen and put her in there. You can uh, use some swarm cells that maybe the colony will produce, and I think we'll hear a little bit more about that from Mary Gale as well. But you want to, the, 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 the moral of the story, so to speak, is that you want to stay ahead of this colony um, because if they swarm, half your strength goes with that swarm roughly, and, and therefore you're compromising a, a good strong honey flow if that's your objective. Um, and at this point now, uh, I'll turn it over to, to Mary Gale, who, um, again, I just do give a quick introduction. She's the founder and president of Denver Bees. Um, we have a little bit of technical difficulties right now. She's having to work off of a, uh, 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 a hard copy of the presentation. She's not actually able to see these slides, so forgive us if there's a, a bit of uh, communication that occurs between us to make sure that we're on the same page and looking at the same thing she is. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mary Gale. Hi. Uh, just to reiterate, going into the hive in March, you, out here we have sporadic weather and that, you know, we'll have three or four days of 60 degrees and then it can plummet pretty easily. So just looking at an extended forecast and as soon as you can go in there, um, observe what's going on in each individual hive as far as the size of the cluster, the amount of honey, if she started to build up, and if it's, um, if it's possible at that point you can, you can flip the brood boxes, of course, cleaning any burr comb off, you can flip the boxes um, in preparation for their summer, their spring and summer growth. Um, the next slide, um, as prevention, um, we really encourage the use of the brood comb, um, the brood, the brood comb for the varroa mite, um, and certainly when you've gone through your hive, we encourage the changing out, starting at about three years. So at three years, so in three years you're going to change out your hive body and then the frames and foundation or not if you're not using foundation, and then when you're flipping that box, you can eliminate that box, which if you're not putting an empty box right on it, um, getting cold, there's still days ahead of you that are cold, and you don't want them to have to deal with that. If you have just the one box on there, um, you want to be mindful because now you've limited their space, which can, can force uh, queen cells. But if not, if you're putting the second box on top, um, you can still um, look for queen cells. I don't usually pluck them. Um, I just keep an eye on them and when it looks like about the time they're going to swarm, um, I just shift them out into a new box. And then of course burning the equipment that you have discarded and then feeding them a protein supplement. And then in the fall I always extract the honey and then per hive I save a good gallon of, of honey per hive, so that's what I give them back. I don't ever give them sugar water after the first year. And just like bears or anything coming out of hibernation, although the bees aren't hibernating, they do need a high protein diet, so I think that the protein supplement is, is necessary, especially if there's questionable, bio, questionable bioavailability from, from the plants in the area. Um, I think Denver has, I think we're, we're coming along, I mean we have established neighborhoods and people are, are planning a, a more perennials as opposed to annuals, so there's a lot more, um, uh, a lot more potent nectar or pollen, if you will. It's a lot, it's a lot more to it. So that's what we do. And then, of course, just preparing for swarms and allowing for more space. Okay. Yes. Kim. Good evening, Mary Gail. Hi, Shane. How you doing? It's good to be back. You're going to bring up the, uh, oh, there's that picture. Look at that. Well, Shane, you've already talked a lot about feeding, and, and uh, I can't, I, uh, I don't think I can add anything to that, although I'd like to reinforce the fact that 
we we probably tend to not feed enough and not feed long enough. Uh, a colony in its second year may be, may be gangbuster strong, but it may just be not as strong as we'd like. And, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, whether you're feeding real pollen, if that you caught last summer, a pollen sub substitute, um, or a pollen supplement, uh, sugar, or as Mary Gay does, diluted honey or fondant up in the corner there. A carbohydrate source and a protein source certainly are, are um, uh, you're not going to waste money by giving them, giving them food. If they don't eat it, then you'll know that they don't want it. But uh, if you give it to them and they eat it, uh, one thing that um, um, I might mention with, uh, with uh, uh, pollen supplement or su pollen substitute rather is that when you are feeding this, this spring, uh, they are the bees that are eating it are using it themselves, and what they are doing is they are they are maintaining the protein uh, content of their bodies so that they can continue to manufacture food. And this, and the, right now, the, the brood food that the bees need is incredible because they're feeding the, the, the they're expanding their population and they're feeding a lot of brood. And if if uh, if, if you don't have enough brood stored, or I'm sorry, if you don't have enough pollen stored the bees will actually begin to sacrifice some of the protein in their bodies. Uh, on a really short period of time, this is, uh, well, it's not great, but it's not terribly uh, detrimental, but if it goes on for an extended period of time, say four days of rain, that you can't get out there or you don't get out there, because you can get out in the rain if you have to, but uh, that you don't get out there and they run out of pollen, they have to continue to feed that brood and the, the protein in their body, body begins to take a hit. And, and what happens then is that you have worker bees, you have nurse bees that are shorter lived. They just don't live as long. I mean, they're making the ultimate sacrifice here, if you will. So if you start feeding a protein supplement or pollen, either one, don't quit um, until, until they don't take it anymore and then leave it on a little bit longer because, again, if you get four or five or six or ten days of rain, which isn't uncommon in some, in some places, some springs, uh, like I, like Shane said, it's good insurance. It's you can't beat it for insurance. <laughs> if you need to, um, and and getting into uh, the colony is is um, uh, problematic in some places. Colonies are still wrapped, and and taking the wraps off um, right now may be may, like I said, may be problematic. But the weather is good enough that you can get uh, you can get out to the bee yards and and uh, kind of check around front front doors or tops or whatever you may want to feed a pollen substitute dry and you can put that in a weatherproof I have, I use a 5 gallon pail on a side tipped up a little bit or tipped down a little bit so that the bees can get in and it, it, if it rains it's not going to get wet and bees will actually uh, fly to the pollen powder or the pollen substitute powder, and they just sort of dive bomb in and they get covered with the dust and they fly back and they pack it away in the cells just like they would pollen. They, uh, uh, so it's another way to get pollen or protein into the colony in the spring. Um, use your imagination and uh, don't, don't quit feeding because the weather says it's going to be ugly or it's going to be cold. It's, it, you can get into, you can see the picture there, you can get into and out of a colony. With with a pollen patty, a pollen substitute patty in, in a matter of seconds, and and even if you stress the bees a hair, you're not going to stress them nearly as much as if you go without food. So, uh, I like feeding fondant as an emergency carbohydrate source. It's easy to work with. Um, it's a whole lot of sugar and a little bit of high fructose corn syrup that hasn't been subjected to heat. So I'm comfortable with it putting on there as an emergency feed. I buy it in 50 pound boxes. I slice it into into five 10 pound chunks. That's a little one there in a, in a baggie uh, for demonstration. But uh, I put a rim on on the top of the top super, and I throw that on like a slab of uh, like a slab of bacon kind of, and I just put it on the, on the top bars and and close it up, and and the bees have lots of lots of carbohydrate to get them through the next you know two weeks or three weeks, whatever we have here in Ohio that may be ugly. This has been a long cold winter, and it looks like it's going to be a long cold spring for us here. And uh, I can't not 
uh, ignore my bees because uh, they're going to run, start running low on food here. So, okay, Shane, next next slide. Uh, Kim, before I advance, I'm sorry. Um, I've got a quick question for you. Um, you you mentioned that uh, uh, a shortage of, of protein within a colony, that the bees will actually begin to sacrifice protein from within their bodies. Um, do you know? Are you aware uh, of any evidence or research that that suggests that? Um, there may be some longer term effects with future generations of the bees. In other words, if they're if they're short on protein, presumably then the the uh, richness of the bee food that they're feeding the brood um, might not be as high a quality, and therefore as the as that brood matures and adult bees emerge, that there may be some consequences with that generation uh, of bees. Is is there? Do you know of anything that may be out there to to support that line of thought? Or there is there is some evidence, and 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 we we looked at this a long time ago in Wisconsin, uh, kind of peripherally, but there is some evidence that, and I said a short time. Uh, without protein com without protein income into a colony is usually isn't too detrimental uh, as that time is extended um, and, and I want to I want to be kind of anthropomorphic here the colony begins to think well this isn't a good thing because I'm losing both brood and work and nurse bees here uh, to starvation then they begin to throw out brood and 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 but your comment is good and I suspect but I can't support. I suspect you are correct that if, if I'm sacrificing protein, when I come back, I'm not going to be as good as I was before, mm -hmm. and and I'm not going to you know I'm not going to be able to take care of the next flush of brood as well or do my job as well. But uh, to point to something right off the top, no, I can't. Okay, it's it's a logical assumption though. Well, All right, we sorry. Jack, you sure. See that in other species. I mean, not only bees, but you certainly see that in other species of animals. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, is there is there an example that uh, or a particular instance that that, that you can get, make us aware of? Well, I mean, when you when you think of humans mm -hmm. and if if um, mothers in utero are deprived of a certain amount of nutrition, that that's going to put a strain on her her body and downboard thinking. Is subsequent children, um, and certainly not in our you know, our environments here, uh, we have a lot of nutrition, but in other countries where women are at, you know, folic acid are at, are at odds for getting those in, in adequate amounts, you do definitely see that, you know, in, so much in birth defects or um, illnesses after birth. So, I mean, it, it only stands to reason that you want optimum nutrition at certain, at, at, at the early stages like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good food all the time. Good food all the time. Right, and and protein is definitely a building block, and that's what they need in the beginning. Right. Probably more so than the carbohydrate, because in the carbohydrate, if the if the hive is contained due to weather conditions, they're not going to need the immediate energy, um, as they will when they start flying. Right. Okay. Well, Sim, Kim, uh, sorry to uh, sort of break your flow there with that uh, tangent. <clears throat> Uh, uh, one of the things that that um, a lesson learned here is if you go out there and you have lost a colony, and this is the time of year where, <coughs> excuse me, where it is not uncommon to have colonies lost. Probably the best le lesson you can learn is why did it die, so that you don't do it again, or so you can prevent it from happening again. And and just a quick review of probably the most common problems of uh, colonies perishing during the winter up in the upper left hand corner is a diagram of uh, uh, one of those ventilated inner cover uh, insulation boards such that you can have adequate ventilation all winter long yet you don't get a lot of condensation and water dripping back into the hive. Uh, this is a very common technique. You've got a styrofoam board above your inner cover with a with a, a, a easy escape so that warm air goes up but because of the insulation, the uh, because of the insulation, the inner cover isn't cold, and the, and the warm air escapes without condensing. Uh, 
one of the easiest and simplest ways to uh, ensure good ventilation and, and no condensation. In the center top there, you've got, uh, you already talked about Nozema, Shane, and uh, although the old Nozema uh, tended to be a spring problem, the new Nozema tends to be more of a uh, late spring summer problem, but you will see this right now, just as you showed it, and, and enough of it will, you know, can, can cause a colony to perish. The next photo over showing the empty comb, if you look closely, you'll see the uh, fecal deposits of varroa mites inside those cells, those little white spots, so you know that this colony had a boatload of varroa when it went into winter, and, and of course, um, that, that kind of stress uh, took out the colony sometime during the winter. Down below, you've got a, a colony that starved. Uh, inches away from food. This starvation is generally the result of not enough bees or too cold too long, and if you want to say too cold too long, I think we were here the last time uh, you and I and, and Mike Palmer did this, Shane, we talked about uh, preparing colonies so that even no matter how cold or how long it was, a well-wrapped colony, a well-protected colony was going to be able to move pretty much all the time inside of a hive, and, and this frame came from an unprotected colony, and you can see what is it, about an inch and a half from salvation there on both sides. <laughs> of course, a colony uh, that goes queenless sometime during the winter and and uh, when it begins to, uh, time to lay, uh, when the queen should be laying and there's no queen to lay, the population dwindles and um, by the time you get out there in early spring, it's dwindled to the point where it's not going to come back. You've got no brood. You've got uh, only old, old, old bees and uh, the colonies, if not dead, uh, certainly going to be there very soon without without a lot of major work on your part. So uh, analyze if you find a dead colony, analyze what went wrong, and uh, learn from the situation so that uh, you and the bees will not make that same uh, those same errors next uh, next fall. So take a look at the next one, Shane. Uh, you both have talked about health. And and uh, uh, just very quickly, up in the upper left-hand corner, of course, um, uh, varroa mites. If you got a if you got a lot of varroa mites in the spring, you've got a small colony. Most many of them are exposed. Uh, uh, this is a time to uh, uh, work on those. Uh, it's a little early for drones right now in my part of the world, so uh, uh, putting drone comb in isn't going to help a lot for about another month or so. So if I've got a lot of uh, uh, exposed Burrow, I've got to do something. I'm certainly going to have uh, some part of my screen bottom board. Uh, and the way that I do screen bottom boards is I close in the space underneath so it's dead air so that they continue to fall all winter. Uh, sugar, uh, powdered sugar perhaps to help them slip off. Uh, if, if you're using some of the soft chemicals, some of the essential oils or, or um, um, uh, uh, organic acids, um, not a bad time to work on those, but you, you're never going to know unless you're monitoring your, your varroa population, so get a sticky board on and see where your colony is, and, and uh, you can make some better decisions once you know the, the mite load of your colony. Over on the right, of course, is the, excuse me, is the uh, result of American fall brood. Uh, this is um, uh, Obviously, something that should have been caught long ago. But if you're in this in the colony this spring, um, and you find this with the, you can see the scales in there. Uh, well, that your choices are are really limited. You can put antibiotic in, which is is not a not the best choice in my opinion. Getting rid of the colony, getting rid of the inoculum, certainly is uh, probably in my opinion a better choice. But you won't know unless you look, and you won't you know you got to get in there and, and look closely. Down on the bottom right, you see a, a small nuke down there, and and if you take a look, it's sitting on the ground, and there's mud all over. And if you look around that that nuke, um, in just a little bit here in Ohio, down south, you may already be there. It's a sign of skunk damage, and you get. Uh, uh, mama skunk coming up, um, scratching on the door. Bees come out, and and then she eats the bees. And a good sign of that is mud on the on the front door, scratches around the bottom. Skunk scat scattered around, usually containing a whole lot of dead bees, partially digested bees. And and uh, the way to solve that, of course, is to get them off the ground. But um, you got to do it. Should have done it last fall. In the middle there is a, a good sign of European fall brood. The the, the the goal, not the goal, the uh, 
the, uh, the the sure sign that something's going wrong in your colony is when those you notice those brood are a nice yellow. Some of them have even melted down and they're even darker. Brood should be ne flashing neon white, and and at all times of the year. And if you pull a frame and you're seeing brood that's off color, it's you know brown or yellow or tan, you know something's up. This time of year, um, European is a stress disease, uh, nutritional stress, temperature stress, protein stress. Take your pick. Uh, they all kind of gang up on bees, and 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 you got a stress, you got a stress colony, and that's when uh, both uh, European and right next to a chalk root show up. Uh, they're opportunists, and you've got a colony that is resources are low, and its uh, uh, strength is uh, right at the edge. Uh, these diseases come in and uh, are able to uh, get a get a foothold. Generally, uh, the old timers used to say, and, and that's pretty much true, is nothing better than a honey flow for European fowl brood and usually chalk brood. And that's because when you get a honey flow, the stress generally lets up, and, and you can <clears throat> you can uh, pretty much count on it. My opinion is that a you should have never got there, and b uh, once you see it, you should have been doing what the honey flow is going to do anyway, which is relieving the stress. So. Make sure they got enough food. Make sure they got enough protection. Make sure that there is other things going on. Uh, European fall brood tends to go away um, if you pay attention to it. Chalk brood, a little more finicky. It can be. Um, it can be. It can be a problem. And there are some some um, lines of bees that just never ever really uh, recover from it, and they just always suffer. And there's always a lot of chalk in the in the bottom board, and then the front entrance, and then the cells. And once you see this, and, and you know if if it doesn't go away after a good uh, after a good, a good honey flow gets started, then you've got to you got to start thinking seriously about requeening and getting rid of that line that's susceptible to the disease. So both of these spring stress diseases, watch out for them. Uh, they're both manageable without drugs, uh, but but you got to know what you're looking for, and you got to be able to uh, react quickly. And I'll tell you two things that that. You don't hear often enough, I think, uh, when I say react quickly. The first inspection should be made with snow boots on and a winter coat and stocking hat over your ears underneath your veil. It should be that cold. You should be in and out. Uh, and it, if you can avoid the wind, that's good. Uh, but boy, I'll tell you, that, you know, if you can stop something from going bad a week or two weeks ahead of when you'd normally be out there, you're way ahead of the game for the whole rest of the season. And, and uh, I can't stress enough. We are, as beekeepers, too way too anthropomorphic uh, for our own good. If it's not good for us, we think it's not good for the bees, and in fact, the bees are way ahead of us. So uh, there's been a lot of times when I've been out, first spring inspection, gone out, and it was a nice sunny day, and by the time I got done, it was sleeting and ice on the ice on my on my hive tool, just because it was wet and freezing. But that's when you need to be out there and getting things done and getting uh, getting the job done. Um, I think that's it. Shane, next one. Uh, as I said, there you are. Is is uh, uh, being ahead of the bees, and and we we again are too anthropomorphic. We we tend to think like that the bees are thinking like us rather than us thinking like bees. And and one of the things you need to you need to be aware of is uh, we're going to look here in a minute is is uh, your honey flows. When are your honey flows? Uh, and 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 the first honey flows aren't honey that you're going to harvest, but they're honey that the bees are going to harvest. But they still need room to deal with that honey. Uh, they need to bring it in and as nectar, and they need to store it, and they need to uh, dehydrate it, and it has to have some place to go. And if you don't provide enough room for that nectar to come in. And I know it's only in there on a, on a big colony, and if you've got a warm spring, it's only going to be in there before it's honey, you know, maybe a day or two. Uh, but, you know, you've still got cool nights, and, and the days aren't as hot as they're going to be. Uh, so what you need to be doing is, is, is you know, not be thinking like you, but be thinking like your bees and, and saying, i gotta get, I got to get enough room in there so that they got, there's room for the queen to be laying all that she needs to be laying. You need to keep that brood brood nest somewhat open, and you need to have room on the sides and above the brood nest for nectar to come in and to be turned into honey, and you've got to have room next to the brood nest for all that pollen to come in or that 
uh, so that the bees have enough have enough uh, have enough protein and have enough carbohydrate and enough room for the protein and the carbohydrate to put it. Now the, the stack you're looking at here is a guy named Tom Theobald who's out in Colorado, not far from Mary Gale, as a matter of fact. And and uh, this is a two queen colony, but he's on top of the situation in terms of having enough room ahead of time. He's thinking like a bee rather than thinking like a human here, and 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 he's made enough room so that when this colony's population explodes and they need room, he's got the room there, and that's just what you need to be doing uh, this spring. And of course, if you got a queen that isn't producing. Uh, like you should, and that's the joy of having two or more colonies. You can always kind of compare side by side. If you've got one that's got four frames of brood and one that's got a half a frame of brood, you know you got a problem uh, with that half framer, and you need to evaluate, figure out what's going on, and and uh, and uh, correct the situation. And this isn't a bad time of year if you've got a two or three or four year old queen that maybe your time is coming. You can retire her to a nuke. Uh, for a rainy day and get somebody in there that's going to do the job for you in terms of producing, you know, 500 to 1,000 eggs a day this time of year, and that's what you're going to need uh, to get your population up for your first major honey flow. So uh, the retirement program for queens isn't very good. Uh, <laughs> we, norm we normally... Uh, <laughs> We normally uh, kind of make a judgment, and if she isn't very good, you know, they pinch her or give her the high fuel test, and, and, and you get somebody in there who's, who's going to do the job for you. Now, this has to do if you're a honey, you know, if you're, if you're focused on honey production, and I know a lot of people aren't. Uh, you know, producing honey is good, and I get some, and, you know, I really like it, and I give my extra two bottles to my neighbors or my, you know, uh, friends and neighbors and family. And, and having a lot of bees and, and, and really, really kicking, kicking uh, uh, a colony into action in the spring is important. But there's a lot of people that it's not. And, and, you know, if she's going along and you're happy and she's happy and the colony is looking healthy and it doesn't have a lot of disease, there's nothing, there's, there's just no rule that says this colony's got to produce 400 pounds of honey for you this year. If they're producing enough bees to pollinate your garden and you can sit out there in a sunny afternoon and and uh, enjoy the enjoy the flight of the bees, and you know, boy, more power to you because that's exactly what we should be doing a lot more of with bees, I think. But if if you're looking at a colony or the colony of the queen is failing, uh, 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 at some point in time, if the bees aren't going to replace her, they're not replacing her in time, or you want to get a different line of bees in there that's more resistant or tolerant to some of the issues that we have with diseases and pests. Now is a good time of year to look at doing that. I think I think there's one more, Shane. Am I right? There's uh, there's actually two more. Aha! Well, there you are. <laughs> you both talked you both talked about swarming, and and uh, I, I alluded to it earlier in terms of having enough room and and making sure that uh, the brood nest had uh, the queen had room in the brood nest, especially if you've got a queen if you. Uh, uh, put a queen in, made a split last summer, and you got a queen that's that's raring to go. Uh, you better have room for her because at uh, at a thousand eggs a day, twelve hundred eggs a day, fifteen hundred eggs a day, you know, later into the spring, you you got to have room for her, and then you got to have room uh, once you take a once you pull that. Uh, I think uh, uh, Mary Gale had a slide there that was just loaded with brood and loaded with bees. Well, when all when that frame is loaded with brood, you know, you can figure there's uh, about 9,000 bees on a, on a frame, uh, on a deep frame that has uh, sealed brood on mostly on both sides. You're looking at between eight and 9,000 bees. Well, where are those bees going to go in 12 days? Because in 12 days or less, they're all going to be walking around. And uh, they got to have some place to go. And, and if you are behind the, behind the eight ball and haven't gotten that room ready, plus kept room ready for the for the queen to continue to do what she needs to do, plus provided enough room for nectar and honey and pollen, uh, you're going to be climbing a tree looking for uh, trying to get them back into a box. So um, uh, you got to be ahead of the game. And that, being ahead of that game is being it's not thinking like you when the weather is, is a good, I'll get out there. It's thinking like a bee which it says, it's time to go. So. Uh, you know all the signs to look for when a colony is going to swarm, you know, the peanut shells on the bottom of the frame. But, boy, I'll tell you, if you start thinking they're all on the bottom of the frame, they will be in the trees. I found them on the side of supers, and I found them 
uh, attached to the side of a bottom board in one time, no, no less. And so so um, scraping, scraping queen cells to stop swarming is, I won't say it's a futile activity, but it's certainly a lot of work, and, and all you got to do is miss one, and they're in the trees. So uh, rather than let them get that far ahead of you, because you're just fighting them in, um, you're not working with bees at all when you're trying to, when you're trying to, uh, I know Mary Gale had an interesting tact on, on, on how she deals with swarms, and I hope she expands on that a little bit when we're, when I'm done here. Um, but, but, uh, be ahead of the bees rather than trying to stop them from swarming. Uh, you just want them to be in a situation where swarming isn't even going to have a little mind. So you got one more there, Shane, right? Yes, I do. <clears throat> Maybe. Yeah. There we go. Sorry. Okay, and 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 uh, I know if this is your if this is really your second year, then this is the year you're really going to keep good records. I know you are, because <laughs> last year last year you were busy getting stuff hand to mouth, sort of like the bees were. But this is the year you figure out when stuff, things are going to bloom, and no one no one uh, when your honey flows are going to start and when they're going to end. Uh, allows you the opportunity to be a half a step ahead of the bees, and you say, "Okay, I got dandelion honey coming in. That they're going to turn most of that into bees, so I don't have to have as quite as much room as when the locusts bloom. Then I got to have a lot of room because they're going to a lot of nectar is going to come in in a hurry, and they're going to need a lot of room to put it. So I better, you know, I'm just going to locusts is going to bloom right about where I'm at, right about May first. Uh, but about uh, seven days before that, I better have room up there because they're going to be looking for some place to put that." And you know, fruit bloom and the wild mustards, and wherever it is you are, you need to learn what the plants are that are providing a lot of your resources and when they bloom, so that you can be ahead of them. Because if you build your colony on the flow rather than ahead of the flow, then then um, you got a lot of bees and you don't have nearly as much honey. If honey is your goal, if you're going to sit back and let them do what they want to do, then then um, um, you know, it's a good thing to just let them eat as much as they can. But if you don't provide some extra room, they're going to quit gathering honey for you. And, and they need some honey. I mean, you're looking at, what, 60, 80, 100 pounds of honey going into next winter. you got to have that. And uh, spring may be good this year. It may be really good, wet and warm and provide a lot. Of, and then 4th of July, everything shuts down and doesn't rain the rest of the summer. Um, you didn't make spring honey, you're not going to have fall honey, and you're going to end up having to make some kind of decision how to get them through the winter. So uh, I never ever, be, you know, I never ever bet on the weather. If it's sunny today and i got work to do, I'm going today. I don't care what my job is or what i got planned for. Because if you don't do it today, in my, in my life, it does, probably isn't going to get done. So uh, looking at honey flows, be out there ahead of schedule. Make sure they got enough honey. Uh, the opportunity to make enough honey to get into the winter. Just assume that the rest of the year is going to be going to be a shutout, and there's no more honey, and you missed it because you wanted to go on a picnic or uh, took a vacation, and they didn't get a chance to make the honey and to store it. So I think I'm out of slides now. Am I? Aren't I, Shane? Yes, you are. You have okay. you have reached the end. Um, I've said and, enough. <laughs> and and before we um. Before we open it up to, to questions, um, Kim, you, you mentioned swarming quite a bit uh, about staying ahead of them and, and ensuring that, uh, that you're providing them space and really trying to anticipate their needs well in advance uh, to, to give them the necessary space that they need for brood, pollen, honey, etc. And, and I know, Mary Gale, when we, when we spoke uh, yesterday, we talked a little bit uh, about your um, your approach to uh, swarming and how to deal with it. Um, I'm wondering first. We'll go with you first, Mary Gail. On can you elaborate a little bit on your strategy uh, in how you deal with swarming? As Kim mentioned, you just go into the hives, and it's it's kind of an antiquated the Damari technique, I guess um, would be the closest in that. They circumvent the swarming. That was his method that you keep the queen away from the brood. But that's you have to be somewhat tenacious because you have to you're you're in there and if you do see subsequent uh, swarm cells, queen cells, you've got to pluck those off. What I usually do is when I do flip the 
the hives. I go in and I clean them and I flip the hives. If after that, which I have seen because they're building up quickly, if I do see the, the queen cells, I just keep track of it and then it's soon in, by days. So when I go in there, um, I go in there every couple of days in the beginning, and if I do see a swarm cell, um, I'll just take the existing queen as it's about to emerge and just create a nuke and move it away. Um, we're just in a high density area and I just don't have the time um, to be going in there with the aforementioned method of, of separating them. So, and it's, it's worked. It's worked. It's, um, they're still swarming. They're just not flying. So that makes sense. Yeah, so, so you're not actually trying necessarily, as I recall from our conversation, you are not necessarily trying to um, prevent them from initiating that process. You're just trying to rather intercept um, them Swarm. from actually Swarm. completing the process. And, and that's, right. yeah, and that's, that's a really important thing given where you are in Denver and I suspect we have a fair number of people that uh, may be in <coughs> urban settings. And so, so of course, swarm control uh, of some, some form is, is really sort of imperative um, because it could compromise uh, your well, beekeeping up, experience. Yes, it ends up being, it can, I think the propensity is there, that it can be a platform for a disgruntled neighbor. That, yeah. And, and so that's what we'd rather you know, be ambassadors rather than defending a situation or explaining the swarming. I mean, there's going to be swarming, period, because of the feral bees. Some swarming is inevitable. People aren't going to catch it. But for the hives I have, and, and I mean, Kim, you mentioned that queens living four years. I mean, I don't know if, if many people have such longevity with queens, which is another issue on into itself. But if there is a queen and she is survivor stock and she has you know, been around two years, you definitely want to keep that. I mean, you do want to bring up that line. Longevity in Queens is uh, something that we don't just don't see much of anymore, but I know there are some breeders, Joe Latchaw here in Ohio is really looking for Queens that uh, go into their fifth year is when he replaces them. Fifth year? That's amazing, yes. Whew. That's, that's yeah. you know. <laughs> but But that's not uncommon. I mean, if you go back, um, you know, I'm not going to say that it's common, but, but a queen that lives three or four years should be the norm rather than the exception. Huh. That's, that's really quite, uh, quite impressive. Um, yeah, there's, you know, the, I, I'm thinking of, I, I gave a talk on, on queen maladies, and I, I stumbled upon some research that was done over in Europe that basically found that um, uh, a queen that's overwintered um, is is three times more likely to swarm, um, and so you know either you're going to have to take um, uh, some proactive steps to to again either intercept that process after they've initiated it or um, do something to alleviate their their burning desire to do so, um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and really that's that's what it is. It's an instinctual thing. Um, they're genetically programmed. They're they're instinctually programmed to swarm. That's the way they propagate their their species, not at the individual level, but at the colony level. So it's. So do you think that they're? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you think that? I mean, I'm sure there's probably nev never been any studies done, but there's been, there's a lot of requeening and a lot of um, uh, mitigating the, sw the swarm process. Do you think that when that happens, that you're actually um, the queen's going to the existing queen is going to go into a more dormant stage if she's not allowed to swarm because she at one point she stops she stops you know putting down pheromone on the the eggs that she is laying um, you know there's less foragers I mean she so when she she stops putting down the pheromone so then they're going to start to kick in a swarm cell um, do you think that by intervention there that if you do force her to stay, that she's going to go, that she's going to lay less. Well, the, 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 the event, um, the, 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 the process is a, a one of selection. Um, and, 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 and you can 
in a fairly in a relatively short period of time select for bees that swarm three times a year and you can select for bees that swarm much less and it, and it's all uh, the selection of the queen and and her contribution to the to the situation so it, it it's not a it's not that you're you're bending the rules or that you are uh, making something artificial it's that you are it's a selection process for bees who just seldom swarm and and it's not an uncommon it's not it wasn't an un, it wasn't as uncommon as we'd like to think um, years ago and and I think it probably should be more common than it is now I certainly would like to see you have a queen for three years I'm paying 30 bucks for a bug uh, I'd like to keep her for three years and and uh, have her be just as productive now you know she may she may calm down after the you know the second year and begin to slow down and then you take a look and you evaluate her but uh, would you like to have a queen for four years I mean, I mean yeah exactly yeah and 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 and, and, it's, and by not doing anything artificial to her, not not any of the swarm prevention techniques, she just doesn't. You know, she isn't going to swarm because of the selection process you've done. If you do have a queen and she's in her second year and there's not been any signs of swarming, do you ever force swarm cells so that now you're getting a new queen? You're going to get a queen off of that, so you're going to perpetuate those genetics out. Do I know? Okay. But I, I know people that that are. I mean, you take a look at a queen that you look take a look at a colony that I'll say builds up naturally, builds up normally. Is there normal in, in build up? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I, that and that's probably a big chunk of the selection is when you you know she has this third year, she has a swarm. We want some of those genes in our pool here. Um. Uh, I, I I have a couple of comments, and then and then we've got we've got a long list of questions, so I want to try and get to those. But first, um, most recently, um, talking about trying to perpetuate the genetics of a queen that uh, perhaps hasn't swarmed and and may be extended uh, have an extended life relative to to your typical queen. Um, we actually have a, a couple of customers that their whole approach to queen rearing basically is if they find a queen that they like, they actually compress that colony down to induce a swarming state so that they do produce those swarm cells and, and then do as, as you do, Mary Gale, which is intercept that swarm capture those swarm cells and, and raise those out as their new queen. And they, they uh, 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 then split that colony basically to uh, alleviate that desire and that need to swarm. So they, they perpetuate those genetics, get some good queens out of the process, and yet still don't le lose uh, half their colony to the swarm. And then the, the other thing is that um, I, I guess going back to what you said originally, which Mary Gale, which is if your queen begins to shut down in, in preparation for swarming, I think most people, um, I'll certainly put myself in this category, um, for <laughs> it, embarrassingly so, um, that if your queen gets to the point where she's shutting down and they've already begun producing swarm cells, it sometimes, it, it takes a lot of, of effort. Uh, like Kim was saying, you can cut all those swarm cells off, you can take efforts, but once they get it in their heads to do it, it takes a lot of effort to try and, and actually prevent it from happening. I, I think, um, mostly because, well, quite frankly, I don't, I don't have the uh, the time that it takes to be in there uh, as often as I should be to try and and thwart that swarm. Um, but let's uh, let's get to a, a couple of of questions here. Um, as I've I've scanned through them, some people have questions about feed your feeding. Uh, Mary Gale of the honey, and they're curious about um, one. Are are you concerned about uh, spreading disease within your uh, operation? And two, just how exactly are you going about um, how you're going about feeding that honey back to the bees that uh, that you've you're, you've saved? Are you doing it in a feeder, or are they in the comb? You know, I had a long history in microbiology, so I'm pretty anal when I extract their honey. So A gets A, B gets B, C gets C, and I never uh, change that hive equipment. Whatever A starts with, A stays with. Whatever B stays starts out with, it stays with. So I extract that honey, and it's just easier to extract it than keep it into a super because I don't want it to 
get hard or be unavailable to them, and then I have to contend with storing that. So I extract it, put the, the honey super back on, they clean it up, I wrap it up, and then I store it, and then the honey is just stored um, just in the pail, you know, in the mudroom. And then in the spring, I just cut it with a little bit of water and feed it back to them. So as fire as pa is, is, is mixing pathogens, no, I don't think I'm doing that mm -hmm. because there's never a chance when the honey is commingled. Okay. So I'm probably more than anyone anal retentive about. And when <laughs> I go out to someone else's hive, I don't take my gloves. I leave my gloves there. If there's ever a malady I come across, you know, I can certainly wash my suit. I have different hive tools I take. I don't use a brush, um, so I don't, I mean, I, I'm kind of, I'm not kind of, I definitely am, I am, I'm serious about that. Okay. So they get the honey through just a mason jar. Okay, so you're feeding it back in, in liquid form and uh, as an entrance feeder or on top of uh, no, the hive with a box? No, it's, it's in a mason jar, and I, I stick it between the two supers. Okay. So when I flip them out and then I put the inner cover over, I'll just put the honey on there. Okay. But I'm kind of, I don't feed them, I mean, I will feed them protein, but I pull any supplement as far as their carbohydrate goes in May. I mean, there, I know there's methodologies out there that they're feeding all year long, and I think that, you know, they're, we're not honing in on their cadence. And I think a lot of the requeening is the same, is, it follows that same methodology, and I think that um, by going in and circumventing or intercepting a swarm and staying with that queen, I think you're going to become more of an integral part of your hive and your beekeeping. And you're going to understand. I just don't. I haven't had a success rate probably under 25 percent when I've just purchased a queen and popped her in there. But it's not the case when I do with what I do with the hives, and the whole double queening works too if you have a weak hive. But um, yeah, that was is what I'd have to say about the food. <laughs> okay. I think that we feed way too much. I mean, I understand if there's a dearth of nectar. But I think you're also, there's a fine line that you have to walk and that you really, you know, what's your objective here? And you need to be flexible with your approach, but keep your objective in that you want to try to perpetuate a healthier species. Mm -hmm. And just randomly pulling out queens or overfeeding or not understanding what you're doing or having a method to your madness, I just think it's chaos. <laughs> okay. Um, what do you... Uh, and there's a follow-up to that. Do you uh, do you cut the honey at all? Do you do you dilute it with water, or just do you just a little bit of water? Just a little just bit of water. Just a little bit of water. Just a little bit of water. Because I feed the um, I feed the protein supplement dry, and they do go to it. As Kim mentioned, they do go to that. So I just what I do with the protein supplement is I just sprinkle it on top of the bars, mm -hmm. and then I put the honey on there. So they do have added um, added water, and so that's how I do it. Okay. Um, there, there have been a couple questions in here about uh, feeding uh, protein supplements, and and there's, I'll just quickly say that there's there's a, several types and brands, etc. out there. There's patties. There's uh, the dry that you just alluded to, and and Kim made mention of earlier, that where you can either uh, mix it with a little bit of sugar syrup or or even honey if you'd like uh, to make a patty, or in in the cases as you're doing sprinkling it dry on the top bars you know i think i think most of us at some point have seen bees in places that sort of make us scratch our head like on our compost pile um you know they'll they'll pick up uh dried powder from from just about anywhere if they're desperate enough and and so a dried protein powder is just fine um a, a couple of questions coming in about you know people signing in late just to, as a quick interjection this this is being recorded. It will be posted to uh, Brushy Mountain's website. It'll take me a day or so to get up there, but it'll be in our video library. Um, Kim, this one's for you. Um, there's, I guess, two ways to approach uh, answering this question. Um, what population loss is normal for a hive over winter? And I guess I could see it as what sort of percentage of your colonies might you lose? And also sort of what percentage of, of the population of an individual colony is sort of uh, within the realm of, of normal, and I'll just let you try and wrestle with that one. 
Thanks, Shane. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, f to address the what's the normal population of a colony, and and it has there's at least two, probably more, but there's at least two variables that you have to consider going in. First one is your population going into winter. Is it big, uh, or is, uh, is it a small? Um, you know, if it's big going into the fall, you want it big coming out in the in the spring, and if it's small going into the fall, you you hope that it's still. Uh, um, not too small coming in the spring, so so that's part of the, that's part of it, and 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 it ha a lot of that has to do some of that has to do with the race of bees that you're you're dealing with. If you're raising Italians, um, uh, they don't know when to quit uh, uh, raising brood in the fall, and they eat food all winter long, and they raise a lot of bees if they have a lot of food and they don't have a lot of stress, and you'll come out of the spring with a lot of bees um, uh, ready to go in the spring way ahead of you if you're not on top of things. And and people who raise bees for bees want to produce packages, uh, want bees for pollination, uh, uh, like Italians for that very reason. If you've got carniolans, uh, they may, they probably are going to go into fall with a relatively small, you know, they're not going to have nearly as many bees in the fall. They begin to slow down a lot sooner and stay slower in the fall than Italians are. They're much more conscious of the resources they have available, and they are uh, use a lot, as a result. They use a lot less, a lot fewer resources in the in the during the winter. They'll eat less honey, um, but but uh, they they will eat some, and they will begin some brood rearing. But they're going to come out of spring um, with not a big, huge population until spring is kind of ready, and then they explode because uh, they're. Their background says you got a short spring. You got to go fast because if you don't, you're going to miss the flow, and then it's all over. So they're they're anxious to get going in the spring. So if you're not on top of them, but uh, and then you've got bees like the Russians, which and the Carniolans, uh, I'm sorry, the Caucasians who are like me and like to sleep in in the spring, and they're going to wait. They're going to wait until life is really good outside before they before they uh, uh, begin a lot of uh, population growth. So they're going to go, the, the, Carni the Caucasians, the Carniolans, the Caucasians, and the Russians are going to go into winter with fewer bees, consume less food, um, and then come spring do their own thing. So, so how big should a colony be? If it's Italians, it better be bigger than a, than a Carniolan. Now here's one of the things you want to think about inside of a colony. Um, when you've got, uh, we had a good picture of those bees dying inches from food, and 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 that is a, that is directly due to not having enough bees for whatever reason. They either died during the winter, or you didn't go into winter having enough bees. You want enough bees in the fall that they can go basically top to bottom, side to side on most of the frames that have honey on. Uh, if you've got them huddled in the middle and they can't get to the edge to get around to the other side of the frame, then you've got a problem. They will die inches from food. So you've got to have a big enough population in the fall that they can fairly easily move around the edges of frames over the top or under the bottom of frames to get to food on the other side. Uh, if, there's, if you've got the food too far away and they can't get to it, again, they're going to starve inches from food. How many bees should die in the winter? Not too many. How's that? <laughs> uh, I, 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 uh, that's a tough number to call. Yeah. But th there's some normal attrition, and 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 if you go back to if you go back to um, about July, when you start taking care of the bees that are taking care of the bees that go into winter, if if your July bees are healthy, then they're going to be able to do everything possible to take care of uh, the. The, the group of bees that take care of the winter bees, that, that raise the winter bees, and, and, and what you want is those July bees healthy so that the August bees are healthy so that the October bees going into winter are healthy. So if you've got healthy bees going in that have been fed well, that have had no nutritional stress, you as a beekeeper have reduced or eliminated any diseases and pests and any of those sorts of stresses in the environment your bees are in is clean, pesticide free. Uh, and then you add adequate winter protection, and and we do not add enough adequate winter protection, uh, I think, anymore. 
Uh, if you do those three things, your, your, your attrition over the winter is going to be relatively minimal and it should be, it should be to the point where it's certainly not clogging the front door. And, and even with Italians, with a huge population, those bees should be living until February, late January, those winter bees, before they start dropping. And, and then they're being replaced uh, one and a half to two bees for everyone that dies because Italians do that. But you should not have thousands of dead bees on the bottom board. I think in, the, in, in a well-protected, well-fed, healthy colony um, right now in March. How's that? I didn't give you numbers, but I gave you a, hopefully a, 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 a sort of a side-by-side, blow-by-blow why to get there. That that was that was pretty good. And, and the one point that I just feel it necessary to emphasize that that you brought up, which was taking care of the bees to take care of the bees that that get you through the winter. You and I have, have talked about that in the past, that, that uh, oftentimes many beekeepers don't begin to think about winter preparation until after they've pulled off their fall honey, uh, in which case that could be, you know, depending on where you are, August, September, maybe even in October. And, and that's really uh, way too late to be thinking about winter preparation. Um, so I'd just like to emphasize that. Um, I, I do just want to, to put you back on the seat a little bit, Kim. In all your, I know you do a lot of polling and questioning and surveying uh, for the magazine. Um, do you have just a, a statistical average of, of what percentage of the hives are lost in, in the U.S.? <coughs> this year, uh, I think it's running a little bit less than 30%. Uh, and, I, and I go way out on a limb to say that because the, the AIA, the apiary inspectors people have not conducted their um, or published the results of their survey if they've done it yet, and nor have uh, any of the other official uh, surveyors. The people that I've talked to have said it's a little bit better this year, but they had more bees. Um, I, and I got to tell you, across the board, people are taking a little bit better care of bees this year than last year, last year than the year before, and it's only just because of the attention that what happens when you don't take care of them is getting, uh, avoiding pesticides and better nutrition and, 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 and getting rid of old comb and better winter protection and more food and better food and food in the right places in the colony over winter. All of those things people are beginning to pay a little more attention of. I, I, we, we just, I, I think as a, as a race of beekeepers, if you will, have, if you go back in the literature 40, 50 years ago, you take a look at the problems that wintering caused. Uh, and people, beekeepers, that was, that was the problem that beekeepers had was winter. And they put a lot of energy and resources and thought into, into how to not have a problem. And when Varroa came along, we pretty much abandoned all of that and, and focused on dealing with Varroa. And, and I think we are now slowly getting back into looking at the other problems that bees have besides Varroa. We certainly can't abandon that. But uh, I think I, I, I'll go out on a limb and say a little bit less than 30% this year, but, but you know, people are going to come back and prove me wrong. So, But it's okay. a, it's about, it hasn't changed a whole lot in the last five years. Okay. Um, Mary Gail, we'll, we'll go back to you and, and give Kim a bit of a break. Um, we, as I mentioned, uh, and as I suspect, I think we've got a fair number of people from, from urban areas tuning in here this evening. Um, and, and actually, one person's posted that they, they've lost the battle with their, their county council um, in trying to uh, uh, create a, a beekeeping ordinance. What uh, information can you um, share with us that 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 you found useful that was beneficial to you um, in in creating a an ordinance that uh, allowed for bees to be kept within uh, Denver. Well, I think there's a myriad of of components there. It's, I think it depends on your city council. I mean, none of them typically are steeped heavily in the sciences, so they're not going to understand the synergy or the tropic dynamics or even even the bigger picture um, of environmental health. And I think that there were, there were, you know, I may have been the catalyst and then I was the one that got called out, but there was certainly a, a contingency of, of beekeepers along the front range who showed up and were very supportive. And they had a precedent set um, 
certainly not in high density areas, but they had there had been a precedent set in Aurora, which is um, you know, equally in size, equal in size to Denver that just sits to the east of us. They had set a precedence and had put in a B ordinance. Um, I think that again is if they see if they see us as being ambassadors and being out in the community and, and you know, historically, I mean there was a huge enormous there was a disconnect between beekeeping and America. I mean Tammy Horn wrote a wonderful book, um, Bees in America. And then we disconnected. And so I think insinuating beekeeping back, and of course, it, it wasn't, in, in, there's the whole wave of sustainability and being green. And so I think it's just this huge wave that's coming in. And bees are on that. I don't think it's any one person that's, you know, it's doing it. It's just a wave now. So I think insinuating that back into the communities. You know, when Tammy Horn came, I had probably 100 um, invitations printed up specifically for uh, council members and municipalities that had yet to vote on it. And I don't think one of them you know, showed up. And I, I think that it's, it's, it's going to be an arduous process, much like getting bees back to a healthier place. It's not going to be, there's, not, there's no panacea out there, but it's just going out there. It's being involved in the communities. And it, there's enormous involvement along the Front Range, um, I mean, with garden groups. They're even considering, you know, bees, the community gardens, and you know they've come up against some some issues. Some gardeners don't want them in there. Um, the liability. Uh, so I think it's it's re it's it's a paradigm shift of of what's healthy and what's not. And we have such a such an idea of what's healthy as far as cosmetics and what we think that parks should look like or lawns should look like and. I mean, there's a lot of beekeepers that love bees but hate wasps. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the absurdity in that that wasps are great are great pesticides. You know, they don't understand, you know, the pheromones, the caramones and, and how that's all a balance. So I think that um, without getting too <clears throat> convoluted here, that I think that Denver was in a situation we had the Democratic National Convention here. I think we were just primed. Um, so I don't think that there was a a huge, I don't think we were up against a huge <clears throat> contingency saying no. I think that it, like I said, there were, I think there were 17 people that showed up to the council meeting and they all were well spoken and had something dynamic to say. They had been experienced. So I think again, just being ambassadors in the community, um, we have a, a program um, that we're working with. There's um, single mothers learning um, transferable skills. So I think just getting inter being an integral part of the community, insinuating ourselves in, um, in a good way, I would have to say that's what's going to have to happen. I mean, it, there's no argument against bees. It's just having the people in there, having the paradigm shift, reframing it, and that we don't show up on, on the radar because something's gone awry and we have someone. Um, and certainly it can happen. You know the probability is there, not an actuary, but the probability is there that something might happen, and you know it's because of the beehive in my backyard or in someone else's backyard. But we're not in, but we're not habituating mountain lions. Bees are already in our environments, so I think it comes from educating and trying to find where the connection is, and people understanding where the disconnect was. And why bees were taken out of the cities? Why, you know, the house that I'm in right now is my grandfather's house, and there were always bees back there, and it was of no, it was no big deal. They were just back there. He got honey, and just, you know, toe chucked around him, made us carry all this equipment around. Um, so that's how I think of it: is that those municipalities, it's just going to, it's just going to have to be enforcing the beekeeping in a positive way. Um, whether it's showing up at fairs, <clears throat> whether it's doing community outreach, whether it's getting people involved who are disenfranchised. Um, I know there's a, a great group in Denver called Earthlinks, and they have beehives there, and, and they um, help homeless people transfer out of homelessness into um, apartments. And so I think that's, that's where it's going to have to be. Unfortunately, for those who do live in municipalities that don't allow it, um, they want them in their backyards. It, it could be a bit of a wait. But I think the demographic, especially in the urban, there's not been a voice. 
there aren't numbers about beekeeping because no one's no one's done any of the research because there haven't there haven't really been there haven't been beekeeping groups in high density areas and now they're popping up right and left so I think that um, again they can't there's not really going to be much of an argument against it especially when you have San Francisco and you have New York and you have Chicago you have the big cities and and they're doing positive things with this and people are you know, again you know the people who who might not have had that chance it's not you know they're they're able to have hives and sell the honey so it's just not going to be for an opulent minority anymore I think it's going to be very accessible it's a huge demographic and I think that it should be one that should be taken seriously and I think if it, the more we coalesce the more or the louder the voice will be it will be clear so that's what I would have to say about the urban the urban setting all right uh, I, I think that um your point is well taken that I mean there's there's I mean it, it's just ripe for um, trying to promote bees right now there's so much media attention surrounding uh, bees and the beekeeping industry um, there's also sort of this this local foods this slow food more low uh, 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 farmers markets and things like that that are, are really only gaining in popularity and um, of course bees are, are a natural fit with that and there's a uh, uh, an opportunity there to educate people and I think like, like you were saying a lot of people just simply aren't aware um, and certainly if if New York is is able to do it and I think that there's uh, a good a good chance and opportunity for a lot of other places to do it you know I guess the only thing I would add to that is you know the farmers markets and, and grow locally and you know that's wonderful but I I would hope that the objective is for healthier a healthier species because it's been beleaguered I mean certainly we wouldn't want to um, to impinge on what the commercial industry does for us because we all like blueberries and avocados when we want them um, but I think the urban beekeeping beekeeper because there's one or two hives um, that they will be able to, and that's why I've, I've really been, it's really been, uh, it's imperative, and our group has tried to perpetuate that, that we have, you know, those pundits from the academic community who are either published or doing research, that they're there for one-on-one, -on -one because there's been sort of, there's been a dearth because beekeeping has either been covert or the groups have been real far apart and um, they just haven't had the support. So, you know, our group um, has tried to do that. And the other groups, you know, they each have their personalities. You know, they bring in and uh, their component to it. So along the front range, I mean, I don't think there's probably one week that you couldn't hit a bee meeting. So if you have a question, someone's going to be there. Um, it's either going to be, you know, very direct answer from someone or probably pretty close, you know, secondhand. So I think that the information is there, and of course, equipment is becoming more available. So, you know, you're not having to plan months ahead if you need, if you lose your, you know, if you need a new super or if you need some new frames or something, it's available. That's all going to affect hive mortality. That you have information that's readily available that you can ask questions. Um, we just started a bee yard, so we're having workshops so people can come out there because I have noticed there's a certain just trepidation of getting in there. Um, one woman lost two hives, and I think. Basically, it was she was just afraid to go in there, and um, she had studied theory, but when it came to application, um, she was a little standoffish. So I think that that's all going to affect hive mortality, and the more people understand, um, and they have a firm, uh, they have themselves are encouraged, and they have a firm understanding, they will be able to manipulate hives or intercept swarms or understanding how you can. Um, probably force a queen if you have longevity in an existing queen. I mean, all of those are going to have a tremendous impact, and and, the, and it won't be so um, it won't be such a dire situation. Okay, um, it's uh, it's getting on to eight thirty here now, and and so I want to try and be mindful of of all our time. But there's one one more question that I'd like to to try and field here because it seems to be uh, coming up in various forms. Um, and that is, we, we've talked a lot about feeding this evening. We've talked about feeding either honey or sugar water, uh, dry pollen uh, supplements or patties. And, and so the question is, how, 
how do you know whether you need to feed? How do you know what to feed? Um, if my bees are bringing in pollen, do I need to give them a supplement? Um, how do how does someone that perhaps isn't uh, what I guess let me let me ask this: What cues can a, a person pick up on to know whether a colony needs to be fed or not? Because you know this is this is we're couching this as a conversation about the second year, and so. Um, we're still trying to learn the cues from our colonies. <laughs> you know, even even after doing this for for a lifetime, uh, beekeepers are still trying to learn the cues. So, what indicators can a person look for that a colony needs to be fed? And and Kim, we'll go uh, we'll go to you. Uh, a good way to start, just plain a good way to start, is to take the cover off if you if your colony's not wrapped, or if it is wrapped, and you can get at your cover. And look in the intercover hole if you've got intercovers. And if you see bees right there, the one thing that has happened is that they have gone from where you left them last fall, which was probably the bottom of the colony, and they have worked their way to the top. Now, there may be lots and lots of food on either side of them, in which case you have to look further. But if they are right at the top, if you look down through that hole and you cannot see down between frames, then you know that they have at least eaten that much food. <coughs> Excuse me, if you uh, placed your food last year uh, when you were arranging and letting the bees arrange their food such that most of the food was above the cluster and not much to the sides, then, then, then you know where food is in that top box. If the whole top box was full and, 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 and the bees are at the intercover hole and the weather is relatively warm, then you can be probably feel pretty safe that they're going to be able to spread out and get to the food. If most of the food was above the cluster and not much or not as much on the sides and you've got two weeks of winter left yet and they're underneath that hole, you can probably guess. So this is this is an unobtrusive observation to start with. If the weather is if the weather is above twenty five and the wind isn't blowing, pop the inner cover and look. Don't, you're going to be in there 30 seconds, but what you're looking for is you're looking for honey on either side of where those bees are. Have your veil, have your smoker, but look and see if there's honey. If you see honey right away, you can put the cover down and you can say, okay, i got a little bit of time yet, but I didn't see a lot of honey. I better get some food on. If they don't take it, they got a lot of honey. Uh, if you didn't see any food, then you know they're going to need some. If you saw eight frames of honey on that top box that they haven't got to yet, but it's going to be 20 degrees for the next two weeks, are they going to be able to get to that honey? So how much is enough, Shane, uh, is a function of two things. One is how much is there really and how much are they be able to eat? And you know one more thing that we don't do? I'll, I'll, I'll ask how much is a, when you go to heft a colony, how much does it weigh? And, and, and I've, I've been hefting colonies for 30 years and I still haven't figured out. I mean it's heavy or it's not heavy or it's kind of heavy. You know that's not a good measure, and and I got a scale, I got a, a a spring scale, and I put it on the back, and I put it on the front in the fall, and I know how much that colony weighs within a couple of pounds. Should be about 165 pounds. My eight framers are a little bit less. So, uh, come spring, that same metric works. You weigh the colony, and how much should it weigh? Well, you know you've got you've got a you've uh, you've had a lot of honey, and a lot of that honey's been turned into water vapor, so some of that's escaped. Some of it's been turned into bees. So that weight hasn't left, but some of it uh, should still be there. So you should be in the 120 to 140 range. If it's lighter than that, then you better look further. So uh, I err on being in there too early and feeding too much. And 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 uh, it, it's it's I hate losing bees. I really really hate losing bees. And I'm going to do most anything I can so I don't lose bees. If it's feeding too much too soon. Uh, so be it, because I hate losing bees. How's that? That uh, that's excellent. Um, with that, um, we've gone now for uh, about an hour and a half, um, and I, I I try to be mindful of of everyone's time. Uh, it's well beyond the uh, the hour time allotment that we had planned for this evening, but there was some good conversation. There's a lot of questions that went unanswered, unfortunately. Um, but uh, if you get in touch with us, we'll do our best to try and um, to address those questions. Uh, again, this, this will be available for review uh, up at uh, Brushy Mountain's uh, video library 
uh, in a day or so. I'd like to uh, extend a, a great deal of gratitude and appreciation uh, and thanks to Mary Gale from Denver Bees uh, for joining us this evening and bringing a, a, a Western perspective. And of course, uh, Kim from uh, Bee Culture Magazine, the editor there, uh, doing some fine work with that, uh, that magazine. Um, uh, and I'd like to thank all of you that tuned in this evening and uh, hope to, uh, to see you at the next one. So thank you very much, Kim and Mary Gale, and, and perhaps we'll do this again in the future. Thanks, Shane. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks.